Well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak, um, and good afternoon. Um, my name is uh, Ollie Hawkins. As uh, Julia said, I work as a, uh, an editorial data scientist in the visual and data journalism team at the Financial Times. Um, you may be wondering what an editorial data scientist does, and while that's not the motivating question for this talk, um, you should get a pretty good idea in the course of the talk what some of my work looks like. Um, the most important thing to know for now is that while I'm not the first editorial data scientist at the Financial Times, I am only the second. Uh, the post <laughs> has existed for only three years. It's uh, evolved in that time. It's continuing to evolve. Uh, my predecessor was another Ollie, Ollie Elliott, um, and uh, he joined the editorial team from the corporate data science team. The FT has a data science team internally that is part of its analysis function that looks at things like customer retention and article recommendation systems and so on, uh, and, and that's how the thing started. Uh, my background is a bit less conventional in the sense that I've, I've, I've had a career that makes a lot more sense looking backwards than looking forwards. If you kind of go through my career chronologically, there are some swerves, whereas if you sort of look in the rearview mirror, it's very clear there's a sort of collection of interests which all kind of neatly coalesce in my current role. So when I started out, uh, I was a software developer, and I did that for a few years, and then I became a journalist with the BBC, uh, specialising in data journalism at a time when data journalism was really taking off as a sort of recognised practice within newsrooms. Um, but the more time I spent as a data journalist, uh, the more interested I became in data for its own sake. So in 2011, I left journalism in order to spend more time with data, um, and I joined the statistics section of the House of Commons Library. Now, some of you may know the library. If you don't, it's the... Uh, research service for members of parliament and select committees, kind of equivalent to the Congressional Research Service in the United States. Uh, and it was there that everything started to come together in terms of all these different things that I'd done, because I joined the library and all of the statisticians in the library were using Excel, and I started to realise that these programming skills that I'd had um, earlier on in my career, that I'd developed earlier on in my career, were increasingly relevant and interesting in the field of data. Um, so I, I sort of picked up JavaScript again and started using it for data visualization. I picked up Python again and started using it for data analysis and I started learning R and I kind of came to evangelize um, the whole kind of um, data science approach to, uh, to doing data analysis in the library. I established a data science program in the library. I became their first data scientist. And then last year uh, I joined the Financial Times and it was really interesting going into a newsroom having spent 10 years away and discovering that all of these transformations that we'd been going through in the statistics section of the library were things that had been taking place in newsrooms. Um, and I've got, I've got some data that shows this. So there's an organization in the United States called the uh, National Institute for, for Computer Assisted Reporting. reporting. Um, and if you think that sounds like quite an archaic term for data journalism, it is. It's, they've been around since 1989. And since the mid-90s, they've been having an annual conference, uh, which is really the kind of the global data journalism conference called NICAR. Um, and somebody posted recently on Twitter a breakdown of the sessions from the 2004 NICAR uh, by the technology that they were focused on. Uh, and there's a few things to notice. I mean, spreadsheets at the top, obviously. Um, but a couple of things that really stand out here is, first of all, it's very proprietary. You know, ArcView is a proprietary um, GIS tool, Access proprietary database, VBA, FoxPro, <coughs> all proprietary. Second thing is, there's not that much programmatic data analysis at all. There's a little bit of Perl and a bit of VBA, but this is when data journalism is in an, in an era where just figuring out how to use web search effectively as a journalism tool warranted seven sessions. Um, <laughs> so things have moved on a little bit. So here is the table from this year's NICAR, which was literally about six weeks ago uh, in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, and you can see, uh, so spreadsheets still at the top, obviously, only now it's Google Sheets, not Excel. And then the next four technologies are all technologies of programmatic data analysis. Um, and the winner, by some way, is R. There's two and a half times uh, the number of sessions on R as there are on Python. There's three times the number of sessions on R as there are on the web stack, which is, I find fascinating because uh, the web stack is absolutely vital to um, data journalism and it's often the one that data journalists sort of spend their time arguing about in public. Um, uh, but behind the scenes, R has been quietly taking over the field of data journalism. 
I'm really interested in why this is the case. And now I, I'm going to start by making a couple of conjectures, and then I want to talk you through how we're using R at the Financial Times as part of our visual and data journalism, and, and why we find it such a, a useful, uh, you know, w w why we kind of agree with the consensus among, among all of the journalists. So there are two things I think in particular, two characteristics that R have that make it particularly appealing in newsrooms. The first is that R is the fastest way to answer complex questions about data. Um, if you had to distill uh, the, the nature of data journalism, the, 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 what you're doing as a data journalist into a single sentence, it's answering difficult questions about data as quickly as possible and getting accurate answers. Um, and it's partly, the reason it's so fast is partly to do with the fact that, you, you know, the, the, the Tidyverse gives you this vocabulary of functions that let you um, uh, transform tabular data very quickly in all kinds of ways. And it's partly because the, the, the pipeline syntax lets you uh, combine and compose those functions on the command line uh, in, in a single call to, to answer a particular question. Um, and you know, when you're interrogating data under pressure of a deadline, you're in this kind of loop where you're coming up with hypotheses, you're coming up with questions to answer those hypotheses, then you're answering those questions, that leads to some theories, you get some new hypotheses, you get some new questions. And under time pressure, you want to make that loop as tight as possible. Um, uh, Andrew, I think, was t talking earlier on about how um, Pandas is more complicated to use than the Tidyverse, and it absolutely is, but it also just involves a lot more typing. And it sounds ridiculous to say that less typing is an important feature of a programming language, but wh wh when you're on deadline, anything that gets in the way of just thinking about the question you're trying to answer and understanding the answer um, is a problem. So not having to type as much, not having to think as hard about how am I going to turn this question into some code that will lead to an answer. Um, the second reason I think uh, it's quite compelling is because R has a relatively smooth learning curve from beginner to expert. There are people in uh, data journalism like me who have come from a computer science background and then later on discovered journalism, but far more common are people who have come from uh, they start with journalism and then they discover data and they fall in love with it. Um, and for those people, it's really important to be able to show them, get them to understand the benefit of using a programmatic approach as early as, as possible. Um, and when I was evangelizing data science in the House of Commons Library, before I'd really got to grips with R, I ran this session uh, where I was trying to show the benefits to statisticians by teaching some Python. And what I found was I was basically explaining the essential fundamentals of programming before I could show them anything useful. So I was sort of saying, well, these are the data structures and this is what loops are and this is how functions work, but bear with me, because in any moment now, this is going to become you know, very, very useful to you. Um, whereas with the Tidyverse, with about eight functions, you can do everything that most data journalists do in Excel without needing to know, uh, without sort of training as a programmer before using them. If you've got select, filter, arrange, group by, summarize, mutate, left join, and the two pivot functions and tidy up, that's it. That's everything you would ever do in Excel. But now you can do it in a reproducible way and in a way that can be automated. Um, so I think what those NICAR figures show is that there's a lot of our work going on behind the scenes in journalism. And that's certainly true at the FT. These are just some of the stories that we've done in the last few months which have been backed by a lot of data analysis done in R. And you can see in the way that these are visually presented by the graphic designers, uh, a lot of the, the um, mastheads feature a kind of abstract representation of the chart in, in the graphic. And that reflects the way that uh, the FT thinks about data and since the creation of this team, the visual and data journalism team. This was started, I think, about 2015 uh, under the um, leadership of a guy called Alan Smith, who's former head of data visualization for the Office for National Statistics. And um, the FT has had uh, a graphics desk and a statistics desk going back decades. But before this team came into being, they operated as kiosks, as kind of service desks, where journalists would come along and so say, I've written a story, I need a picture, I need some data to plug into these paragraphs or whatever. And Alan's view, and I think correctly, is that data shouldn't be treated as seasoning that's added to a story at the end to give it some extra flavor it should really inform the whole process of how the story is researched and developed. Um, quite often, journalists who don't look at the data will be told things by sources and then ask for some data and find out the source is 
talking not. Um, so reversing the whole priority of data within the organization has been a big part of it. So very briefly, the way the team works at the moment is we've got the graphics team, who are these wonderfully talented and amazing illustrators and 3D modelers. Uh, that's probably the oldest part of the team. We've got the visual storytelling team. That's the newest part of the team. They sort of specialize in these big interactive features. It's a kind of journalism that the industry is often referred to as scrolly telling. Um, and then we have this embedded technology team who are absolutely fantastic. They um, do some front-end development when we need bespoke JavaScript, uh, but they also provide resources and manage DevOps for all of our work. And then in the middle is what I regard as the heart of the team, which is the data team, and this is the, the team that I'm, I'm in. Uh, so the thing that defines the data team is the use of computational methods for daily journalism. And using those <coughs> methods, we create pipelines for collecting and analyzing data. We develop data products for the Financial Times website, and I'll show you some examples of what that means in a little bit. We build tools to help identify and develop stories. This is quite an interesting, I find this area fascinating. It's partly about sort of doing investigative work on large data sets, but it's also, we also um, have been experimenting with doing some machine learning to um, build tools to help find uh, things in unstructured data. And then we help journalists to understand and use statistics and try and, um, try and stop kind of ad hoc statistical errors. I think one of the biggest challenges culturally uh, being a data team inside a newsroom of journalists who aren't always that interested in data is journalists tend to assume that you can just substitute a word for its synonym without realizing that quite often a word has a specific technical mathematical meaning. Uh, and if you just swap it out, you're, you're changing the meaning of the story. So keeping literacy is a big part of what we do as well. Um, this is a kind of concept map of the tech technology that our team uses and it shows you or starts to show you where R fits into it. So all of the stuff in dark blue is infrastructure and everything in pink is something that, that requires coding to use. And so there's two key points I want to make about this. The first is that one of the things we don't use R for is um, production graphics. Very rarely. But generally speaking, uh, graphics that go into the paper are done in Illustrator and Gra most graphics for the website are done using Fast Charts and Flourish, which are both internal charting tools that generate um, uh, interactive visualization. Fast Charts generates basic ones quickly so that journalists can just get up and running with stuff. Um, uh, Flourish is a kind of no-code templating uh, system that can produce a very wide range of nice, crisp, vector graphics-based uh, visualizations. But we can, we can extend Flourish with Flourish Kit, which is a JavaScript framework for writing your own Flourish templates. And Starter Kit is the equivalent framework for the big visual um, uh, scrolly telling pieces. Um, uh, so, so, R, so the second thing is R is not even the only programming language we use. We do use Python for deep learning, for example. But this map kind of undersells the role of R, because actually R is the thing that connects every, every other thing that we do. Um, most data products, data stories, investigations, it starts with R. So the key things we do in R is exploratory data analysis, producing and managing data sets, developing automated pipelines, either pipelines we run locally or pipelines that we run in the cloud, statistical models, web scraping, and developing custom packages for use within the FT. And then the outputs of that work, or, or the fruit of that labor, is then sort of flows out to our visualizations or into pipelines or even when we're using um, Python for deep learning, we produce and manage the data sets that feed into those projects through R. Um, okay, so I'm gonna talk you through just a few examples of um, ways that we've used R to help with journalism. And this, this is a fairly um, typical example of, of how R helps us find stories. So, uh, Gender pay gap reporting was introduced by the government in 2017. Um, every organization, every employer with more than 250 employees once a year has to produce figures on their gender pay gap. Gender pay gap is a fairly simple statistic. It's the difference in median hourly pay between men and women within each organization. So it doesn't capture all of the dimensions of gender discrimination in pay by any means. It's, it does reflect compositional differences in terms of if more uh, women are in certain roles than men, and it's very insensitive to uh, changes at the you know changes at the high end, you know the sort of differences in in, in the highest earners. 
but it does provide some information that you can use to compare different organisations. And the data, the data is published by the Gender Pay Gap Service, and the way it works is there's a snapshot date every year, which is the date that's used as the basis for calculating the numbers, and there's a report date, which is at the start of April. And between, throughout the year, organisations are fi filing their gender pay gap statistics. So we have a pipeline that consumes all this data and looks for things in it. It produces summary outputs for different sectors, for particular groups of organisations that we're interested in. It looks for outliers. So, and we can see what percentage of employers have reported at any point in the reporting cycle. So as we're reaching that reporting deadline at the start of April, we're running this every day and just seeing what comes out. And one of the things that came out this year is we discovered a few weeks before the deadline that most of the central government departments had reported their numbers and things were going backwards in some of the most important government departments, in particular the Treasury, which followed the financial sector in having large and growing uh, gender pay gaps, and things are going backwards in the Cabinet Office, which is where the uh, Office of the Prime Minister is based, and you know, it was the Office of the Prime Minister that introduced gender pay gap reporting. Uh, so the fact we were able to spot this ahead of the deadline and before any other news organisations meant we were able to make a story out of this um, before anybody else. Uh, Another example of how we use R, and th this is something we started doing last year, is we wanted to uh, experiment with getting live charts onto the website. Flourish, which is what is making this chart, has this nice feature where you can link it to a data set at a URL. In our case, our, our data sets are hosted on S3. And, uh, and you can tell it to go and fetch a new version of the data set uh, every five minutes. So during the Tory leadership contest, last year, the first one. Uh, we didn't think there'd be another one when we did this, and we got to reuse the code very quickly. Um, <laughs> but um, we wanted some way of kind of, we, we had a, a, a Tory leadership election tracker, and on it we were keeping track of who, which MPs had declared support for which candidates. We had waffle charts showing that, we had live blog stuff, but we had this chart as well. So what we essentially did was we hooked up, we wrote an R pipeline that would take the data from Betfair on the odds of um, each candidate becoming the next prime minister. And uh, what was nice about this is that, there, if, I don't know how closely anyone follows politics, but the, the election had two, two phases, where there was a Westminster phase, where um, it's kind of knockout competition, where, where every, there's rounds of voting among the MPs, and then uh, at each round, one of the candidates gets knocked out. It's a bit like a reality TV show. And then it goes to um, the members. and. What was great about this is we got this up really quickly and uh, we were able to capture this, which was during the knockout phase. And you can see there are these wild swings in the betting odds. And what would, this one here, um, where Penny Mordaunt suddenly shot up, there was a, a, a poll got published, allegedly a high quality poll of um, uh, conservative members putting her in the lead. And her odds just you know, rocketed at that point. And then another poll came out a couple of days later and they plummeted. Um, so, uh, it was great to be able to capture that. So the way this works is we, um, for any kind of continuously running pipeline, uh, anything that's, like we have a, a, we have a deployment platform called CircleCI, which is great for anything that needs to run a few times a day. Anything that needs to run more frequently than that needs to be sort of continuously running. So we use Heroku for that. So we use, a, a, there's a pre-built uh, Docker image you can use for R. Uh, so we use that. We wrote, developed the pipeline locally, we deployed it onto Heroku using the pre-built Docker image. And the way it works is really simple, is every couple of minutes, the um, R pipeline would fetch the data from the API and write it out as a, a, a CSV data set on S3. And then every couple of minutes, or five minutes for Flourish, Flourish would come and get the new one. So it would keep updating during the day. And we're now using this for, um, for live market charts. We've now integrated, that was our kind of first foray into it, and we've now integrated it with live markets data. So when we had the Silicon Valley bank run, um, we were able to put up live charts of um, stock prices of various banks and things like that. Um, the other way that I, how am I doing for time, June? Okay, the other way that I wanted to, um, other example I wanted to provide about interesting uses of R is uh, this uh, method that we've developed uh, for using Arvest and Chromote to scrape dynamic websites. So many of you will know Arvest. It's this uh, amazing package that makes it really easy to extract data from static HTML. And by static HTML, I mean uh, 
web pages where the data you're interested in is baked into the HTML as text. So when you request the web page, the page you get back contains the data that you're interested in. The problem is, is that more and more modern websites are dynamic. And the way that a dynamic website works is it sends a very small amount of HTML to the browser along with a lot of JavaScript. And then the JavaScript will then run and will build the page dynamically inside the browser. So what you're seeing on your screen is not present in the source file. So if you try and scrape it in the traditional way using Arvest, uh, you just get nothing back. And in fact, if you want to see this in action, go, to, go and visit uh, Twitter on, in Chrome and view source. You'll see there's almost no code at all. There's just like a few lines of code, one of which is a, uh, an instruction to download um, JavaScript. Uh, and Power BI dashboards are a particularly difficult kind of dynamic website to scrape. And that's for a few reasons. They, it's almost as if Microsoft doesn't want you to scrape <laughs> the data. Um, they, uh, so they, it's hostile in three ways. First of all, most dynamic websites, even though they're, they're building stuff, uh, they're not embedding the data in the HTML, there's normally a data download, a JSON file. So you can use Chrome's network tools to inspect Oh, there it's requested a JSON file. That looks like a data file. That's the data file. That's what Flourish does. So you can find the data file for a Flourish chart very easily. Power BI, the data is sent compressed, and the algorithm to decompress it is in minified JavaScript. So unless you're the Microsoft developer who wrote it, you haven't got much of a hope of decompressing it. Second thing that they do, which is really uh, hostile because it goes against all of the tenets of accessibility, is that they render tables using divs. Now, if you don't know what that means, there is an HTML element called table, which is what you're supposed to use for putting data in. When I was doing software development years ago, the big no-no, the big kind of faux pas as a web developer, was to use tables to lay out your web page. So, you know, tables are for data. This is the inverse. This is not using tables for data, specifically to be annoying. Um, so the normal solution for this is what's called a headless browser, where essentially you uh, you script your interaction with the website through a kind of browser that runs in the background. That's possible, but it's quite fiddly and it's quite hard, um, hard to do well. We found a much shorter, sort of sh a way of short-circuiting that process uh, using Arvest in combination with this package called Cremote. And what Cremote does is it, um, it lets you use your local installation of Chrome and to control it through, um, through R. So you can send instructions to Chrome and access its developer tools, and it will do what you ask it to do. So the basic strategy is use Chrome to load web page with dynamic content. You have to be careful here, because when you call a function that sends an instruction to Chrome, the function returns immediately, but the instruction might not have completed executing. It's not like when you call read CSV, which won't return until you've got your CSV data loaded. Uh, the function will return. But, and it will have told Chrome to do what you want it to do, but it might not have finished doing it. So what you need to do is identify a data flag, something that appears in the rendered HTML um, uh, that you can use to identify when the page is loaded. So in our case, one of the pages, Power BI pages we were scraping was, um, it was a table of how many Ukrainian refugees each European country had taken. It was published by UNHCR. Uh, so we knew that the table we wanted always had the word Albania in it. So we could look for that. So then you, you send the instructions to Chrome to load the web page, and then you wait in a hard loop. And every time the loop runs, you get the HTML, the rendered HTML, and you ask Chrome to give it back to you as text, and you look for that text. And then once you've found it, you run it in that instruction again, so you get back the whole web page as HTML text. And once you've got it back as HTML text, you can just scrape it with Arvest in a normal way. Uh, and we've used this a number of times now to get around difficult, um, difficult websites to scrape. Um, so I mentioned earlier that we are, uh, it's often the case that you're dealing with journalists who are new to programmatic data analysis or who are learning it. Um, and so one of the challenges is we want to be able to collaborate across a team with varying ranges of experience and ability in R. So there's various things that we do to support data journalists into becoming better, uh, better computer programmers. Um, so we, have, uh, we run, run weekly R workshops. Sometimes they're... Uh, just informal sessions where we troubleshoot problems together. Sometimes they're taught sessions where one of us will prepare a slide deck and a GitHub repo, um, and we'll record them. And so we've got this big library of tutorials, which are sort of listed in a log, in, and they're ranked. They're sort of there's a little uh, 
variable in there called beginner viewing order. So we have this kind of training course now built up that anyone starting who's interested in learning R can start working through these tutorials and getting hold of the example code. Uh, I offer, and my colleague Ella, who is also very uh, experienced with R, we, we do one-to-one -one help with data analysis. So we'll pair program with people who are trying to do something and have got stuck. Um, we have a ggplot theme uh, called ggft. It's not used, I think it might have been used once for production graphics, generally not used for stuff that actually goes on the website, but it's very nice to be able to just do stuff in the FT style, especially if you're trying to sell an idea to somebody internally. And we even have our own package repository for the FT called FTRAN. Um, so any packages that we make go up on FTRAN, and that means you uh, get around any of the difficulties that might arise with install GitHub. There's, just, there's a nice public URL, <coughs> and you can just add FTRAN. If you're using RM, you can just add FTRAN to your repositories in your R profile, and it will all work as if it was CRAN. Um, so I talked about that learning curve. Uh, one of the other things that we try and do, I've, I've been trying to put in place, is kind of a build a, a path up that learning curve to help people. So the steps in which we're teaching people to use R is start off with learning how to uh, do your work using a project-based workflow. So everything should be in a project. All work should always be in a project. You should always use here for file path. So the idea is you can zip a directory, send it to someone, and they'll be able to run it, assuming they've got the right packages installed. We'll come to that in a minute. The next step is to get them sharing the work on GitHub. It's very important that any work, data work that goes into a story is recorded somewhere um, so that we can find it again uh, and, and, and reuse it if we want to revisit an analysis. Once they're familiar with doing that, we then teach them using RMV in order to uh, create a reproducible environment and improve the portability. And then the next step, which is the big one, is stop them writing scripts or try and get them to organize their projects as libraries of functions where there's a single, everything's in a function and then you have a single analysis file that just imports the functions and makes a few calls. Um, and that's really, it, I think it's, that's the point when you really start becoming capable as a programmer because then it makes it much easier to use per, it makes it um, much easier to think about how what you're writing could generalize to other cases. And then the final sort of, final boss, writing packages to be published on FTRAN. Um, so that's using that kind of approach, we're hoping to sort of bring those journalists who aren't programmers but who've developed a love for it sort of up to um, a level which is, uh, if not, you know, if not sort of full software developer, um, is much closer to what's going on in the product and tech team um, so that we, we're, we, you know, we're instilling the best practices possible. Thank you very much.